Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Dean. I'm the uh, director of Western Approaches. For those who are unaware, it's about 10 minutes walk that way, and it was the, the command centre, the nurse centre of the Battle of the Atlantic during the war. I had the honour of organising the museum, and I am today organising this event with four minutes' notice because the organiser, in great Mersey maritime fashion, has found himself literally out at sea. Uh, so, excuse if the order may change slightly. Today, we gather here to commemorate the anniversary of the passing of an extraordinary individual, Captain Frederick Johnny Walker, and along with honoured guests here today, we have his immediate family have his granddaughter and his, his, grandson, his great grandson here. He was a true hero in every sense of the word, dedicated his life to the service of his country in the defense of freedom, a beacon of courage, resilience, and unwavering commitment, leading by example and inspiring all who had the privilege of serving alongside him. I have the privilege on a daily basis to regale tales of his maverick approach as an escort commander, and his efforts in turning the tide of the Battle of the Atlantic. These are deeds that should be told in classrooms up and down the nation, and the name of Captain Walker should roll off the tongue of every British schoolboy and schoolgirl, in the same vein as his contemporary Sir Winston Churchill, or that of another great naval tactician, Lord Nelson, whose statue Captain Walker would have walked past each time he docked in Liverpool and debriefed his senior officers in Western approaches. Rather than talking about his exploits at the Atlantic, which we've done for so many years, I thought I'd share a little lesser known detail of the efforts he made during D-Day landings in June 1944, just a month prior to his death. He returned home from a successful mission in the Atlantic, and his wife Eileen was aghast at his haggard appearance. The toll had clearly been taken uh, on his strength and resilience. He was killing himself gradually and slowly through his efforts. General Eisenhower, Allied Commander-in-Chief, had decreed that the Normandy invasion forces, and if possible the entire English Channel, must be free from the threat of mass U-boat attack for the D-Day landings to succeed. From D-Day to D-Day plus 14, so two weeks, the assault forces would have to be landed safely, the beachhead consolidated and the build-up of supplies assured. On the 6th of June, 76 U-boats sailed from Biscay bases into the channel to destruct the landings at Normandy. A sightings report started streaming into Starling Walker's ship. He said, Eisenhower wants two weeks. He'll not only get it, but this is our chance to smash the U-boat arm once and for all. So on the 6th of June, D-Day, in those first three days, he directed 40 ships into no, more, uh, no fewer than 36 attacks during which eight U-boats were destroyed, many more damaged. Aircraft claimed another six, and the first enemy wave withdrew. The U-boats returned later for another desperate attempt to penetrate the channel, and for a week there was no rest for men or ships. Each time it was Starling's turn to retire for new ammunition, her crew snatched a few hours sleep, but not Walker. He attended conferences, he adjusted tactics, laid new plans, and would seemingly inexhaustible energy took his ship back to sea to resume its efforts. Only a handful of U-boats needed to reach the landing area to create havoc that would give the enemy, the enemy vital respite. The two weeks demanded by Eisenhower passed without a single U-boat passing through. In the third week, three slipped past the defenders and caused a moment of havoc but they were quickly destroyed. And after three weeks, the U-boats withdrew, again unbelievably mauled. They were never to return in strength. Walker had achieved his final ambition, destruction of the U-boats as an integral fighting force. The Battle of the Atlantic was won. The battle for the Channel had never been lost. Even Walker's own officers were beginning to become alarmed at his grey, drawn face. His lean frame sagged and his normal decisiveness was being replaced by growing hesitancy and an uncertainty for finding the right words when sending signals. Yet nobody could foresee the end. 
Johnny Walker's name was acclaimed in the press alongside those of Patton, Bradley, Montgomery and Mountbatten. An Admiralty representative called on Eileen, his wife, at her Liverpool home to relay the news that her husband was to be knighted by King George VI. Now, she thought, he's half the rest. That afternoon, following his arrival home, the couple went to the movies to watch Madame Curie and could he complain of giddiness and a curious humming noise in his head. He was rushed to the hospital and told he needs quiet and rest. The news that his life may be in danger spread from Eileen to Sir Max Horton and then through the whole command. At midnight, July the 9th, Eileen was summoned to his, her husband's bedside where he passed away. Officially he died of a cerebral thrombosis, but in fact he died from overstrain, overwork and war weariness. His mind and body have been driven beyond the normal limits in a life dedicated to his total destruction of the enemy, revenge for the death of his son and to the service of his nation. Let us remember Captain Frederick Johnny Walker as a true hero, a naval legend and a symbol of hope and courage. May his memory serve as a constant reminder that the impact of a single individual driven by purpose and unwavering resolve can shape and reshape the course of history. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our service. Uh, next year is a special anniversary for the passing of Captain Walker, so we hope to make uh, an even more special uh, and a bigger, bigger occasion of it. So we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you. I used to, I, I also wear um, shirts. <laughs> 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 <laughs>